thank you for that introduction, and uh, you may get out on the golf course. We'll see. See how the rest of this goes. Um, those of you who read the journal yesterday got a Reader's Digest version of a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. I did an op-ed piece that was a real distillation of what I hope to do today. And the genesis of this is that I recently, uh, last winter, reviewed a book by David Burrell for the Thomist called Deconstructing Theodicy. And this past summer, likewise for the Thomist and for a review, I have been studying Eleanor Stump's Wandering in Darkness. Both of these authors are personal friends of mine and colleagues. And they both come out of the Thomistic tradition, broadly speaking, but they come at the problem of suffering in the Thomistic tradition in different ways. And they're both very much conversant with contemporary analytic philosophy, so it's very dialogical. So what I hope to do today is share with you uh, some thoughts based on both of these books. Given the relative size, David Burrell and Eleanor Stump, uh, and I told this to Eleanor today, I emailed her, I said, don't tell David, but I'm going to spend most of my time talking about you. Uh, but I do want to make some points off of Father Burrell's book as well. I am not going to explain 9-11. I'm not going to explain any particular instance of evil. This is armchair theorizing, as philosophers and theologians do, about how it might be possible to make sense of suffering in a world ruled by a provident God who is all-knowing, who is omnipotent, and who is good. The traditional problem, of course, is how could such a God allow bad things to happen? And if you're a believer, you come at it from the point of view of how to reconcile the goodness of God with the horrible things that happen in the world. And the traditional name for that exercise is theodicy most famously done probably by Leibniz and lampooned by Voltaire in Candide. Everything will work out for the best in the best of all possible worlds. That's not quite the way Leibniz put it, uh, but it has the given theodicy a bad name ever since. Now, if you're an unbeliever, what evil does for you or may do for you is give you grounds to reject the existence of God. Hume famously put the argument that's as old as, as the Greeks that if there were a good, omnipotent God, there would be no evil. But there is evil, therefore there is no such God. Contemporary philosophers usually, and that's, so that's what's called the logical problem of evil. How can you cohere with a belief in a good God and an explanation for suffering? And typically people who are interested in that problem have to come up with a morally sufficient reason to explain why a good God would allow suffering, and I'll say a lot about that. Philosophers these days also talk about the evidentialist argument from evil. If you reject, if you think the logical argument doesn't really work, you take the evidential approach, and that's a simple argument as well. Uh, a really good, omnipotent, so on and so forth God would not allow pointless suffering. There is pointless suffering in the world, therefore there is no such God. And people, uh, if you take that track, then the whole point is of arguing, could there be a morally sufficient reason for suffering such that it really isn't pointless? And can we even know what the point might be? Now, let me start with Father Burrell and Job. Um, most of you know the story of Job, and Job figures prominently in both of these books. So I'm going to give you the very, in case you don't know the story of Job, in, three sentences or less. The story of Job goes something like this. Uh, Job is a righteous man. Uh, everything's going good for Job. And he is, he, uh, one day, God is talking with a figure identified as Satan, but not Satan as we understand it. Let's not worry about that. And God goes, hey, look at how good Job is. And Satan goes, well, he's only good because he's the most prosperous guy around. Of course, he's going to serve you because he's so prosperous. If you took away his prosperity, uh, he would curse you. So Job, uh, God says to Job, go for, or excuse me, to Satan, go for it. And, and Job is greatly afflicted. He loses everything, including his family. And yet, he's faithful to God. And then Satan says to God, well, you didn't let me touch him. If I afflict him, it's going to be a whole other story. 
So God says, you can, but you can't take his life. And he afflicts Job. And Job now starts to get really angry uh, about all this with God. And he uh, curses the day he was born. He's in psychic torment. It's, it's, he can't understand what's going on with him. And he gets a visit from four so-called friends. And according to Father Burrell, the, the four friends, and we won't get into that, I can't even remember all their names, uh, these all basically say the same thing, that you're suffering because you did something wrong, and God only afflicts with suffering people who have something to repent of. So just repent, uh, and then maybe you'll get your prosperity back. And Job keeps insisting, I didn't do anything. This is unmerited suffering. And what Father Burrell says is common to all Job's interlocutors is what he calls the Deuteron Deuteronomic assumption that God will reward observance of the covenant and God will punish deviation from the covenant. They all defend some view of this. And what Burrell points out, and this is a very important point for him, is that Job's interlocutors think they're in something like a law court. It's a forensic style argumentation where they, they're like defending their client, who is God, from Job's accusations. And they're giving arguments for Job, to Job about why God is doing what God is doing. Job speaks to God more than anyone else. And his is a cry, a personal cry to God. He doesn't engage in propositional arguments. He's not like in a law court. He speaks to God. They speak about God. And that's a very important distinction for Father Burrell, because he's eventually going to say, we really can't say anything about why God does what God does, and that the healing of suffering is in a per personal relationship of speech to God. Now, Job just keeps saying to God, why don't you answer me? Why don't you answer me? Why can't you tell me why I've done, or excuse me, why you've done something to me that I have done nothing to deserve? And to fast forward through 38 chapters of the book of Job, the climax of the book of Job is when God answers Job out of the whirlwind. And various people have various takes on the, the purpose of that speech. And some people think it's God almost trying to bully Job into piping down, like, hey, where were you when I made the world? I'm God, you're not, you're not going to get an answer to this. As all commentators on this book will note, God never gives Job an explanation for why he suffered. God doesn't come out of the whirlwind and say to Job, hey, by the way, I had a little bet going on up there with Satan. Uh, you did really well. He never says why he did what he did. And the big debate is, is, is what God says to Job any kind of an answer to the problem of suffering? God reminds Job that he's the creator of the world and implies that his agency is unfathomable to a creature. I'm the creator, you're a creature. God doesn't respond to Job in any modern sense of theodicy. I think, what, and this is Burrell's position, what human sufferers need most from God is not an answer to the question of why did you do what I'm doing, or what you did rather, but a renewed sense of being in a loving, personal, in dialogical relationship with the God who is the transcendent creator rather than a theoretical explanation. And the way that Burrell reads Job, it's an argument against there being arguments about why God allows suffering. It is futile to seek an explanation from God or about God. What is needed is speech directly to God. It is the very act of speech from God to Job in response that lifts Job's suffering. You know, one of the things that some philosophers of religion talk about is, how do you go on after you've suffered horrendous evil? And the book of Job suggests that how you go on is by getting into a renewed relationship with God. 
Now, Professor Stump is going to go even, dive even deeper into that. So I'm going to leave that uh, to the side for a moment. In Burrell's book, which is hard to read because he jumps all around, uh, Eleanor Stump's book is very boom, boom, boom. Burrell's book reminds us that Job is also a figure in Islamic, uh, in, in the Quran. And he has an interlude where he goes through um, looking at how the Quran understands Job. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, he then goes into the Middle Ages and medieval commentaries on the book of Job. I'm not going to get into that either. Uh, what's interesting to me and, uh, is that he doesn't think any of the great medieval commentators got the point of the book of Job because they all treat it like it is an explanation for suffering when it isn't. So that Aquinas and Maimonides and everybody else who comments thinks it's some kind of an explanation. Burrell's point, it's not an explanation. That's not what God gives to Job. He gives him back his relationship. And he says what the medievals did that's helpful is to embed the problem of suffering within very sophisticated accounts of divine providence. Uh, and that's where Aquinas especially came in. Because, and this is, uh, I want to come back to this point with um, Professor Stump, Aquinas has a metaphysics which explains why God is directly present to every creature at all times. The, the challenge is to, if you will, translate metaphysical omnipresence to personal presence in a dialogical relationship with God. But you have to be able to tell a story about how that's even possible from a metaphysical point of view. Then he gets in, in the end, to a section on contemporary debates in philosophy of religion. And there are those in contemporary philosophy of religion, and he cites Terence Tilly as one of them, who thinks that anybody who tries to explain why there might be suffering is doing something almost offensive, purporting to explain something that cannot be explained, and that it's almost idolatrous to try to do that. Marilyn Adams, who's another uh, philosopher, her big thing is that the real problem of evil is posed by what she calls horrendous evils. And Stump uses this, some of this language as well. She says, what we need to try to explain, and I put that in quotation marks, because that's really what this is about. What does it mean to explain? What is the, quote, answer? What would satisfy? Is what she calls horrendous evils. She says, this is where the real problem is. Horrendous evils are the kind of evils that destroy a life, and from which it looks like, or as, rather as a result of which, it looks like life is no longer worth living for the person who suffers a horrendous evil. She says, let's just cut to the chase. Uh, it's sort of, it's the stuff that um, Ivan throws out in uh, The Brothers Karamazov. Truly horrendous evils, which seem to destroy the sufferer in such a way, as you say, what possible purpose could there be? And so she, and she has her own take on, on how to uh, begin to, quote, answer that question. What, what Burrell takes from Tilly and Adams is the point he makes, that the contrast between Job and his interlocutors is that they speak about God, Job speaks to God. And it is precisely in this renewed enactment of one's relationship to the creator in that dialogue that you can, quote, go on. At the end of the book, Burrell says, theodicy is a, an outdated project. So uh, he wants to deconstruct theodicy. We should just not even try to do that uh, anymore. And that we need to have, and this is the segue into Stump, there's an explanation, or excuse me, there's an understanding that's not an explanation that there is an answer that's not an answer in a propositional sense of an answer, and that is found in the book of Job. The good news of the book of Job is not the explanatory value of what God says in the whirlwind, but that God accepted Job's plea to speak with him directly in response. So it's the dialogue and it's the narrative. And it's the, that's the interesting thing about the book of Job is and the irony of the book of Job is the reader sees this whole back story and kind of knows what happens. And, and some people take away from that, well, that's the real explanation. When what Burrell and Stump both say is, no, no, the real explanation is what God says to Job in the whirlwind that's not an explanation. It's 
God reaching out to Job and drawing Job into the mystery of the Creator. And as we'll see with Professor Stump, uh, and if you know anything about the Old Testament, which of course you all do, uh, nobody gets to speak to God like Job. And God doesn't speak to anybody in the Bible like he speaks to Job. There's something glorious, she says, about what Job gets at the end, and it's not an answer in the traditional sense of an answer. All right, that's to set the table, really, uh, for Professor Stump, who's got a lot more to say. Now, Professor Stump's uh, book, if you know any of her work, <clears throat> she's been at this for 20 years. Uh, I've known her for 20 years, and she's been working on this book, and it, it, it brings together a lot of the work that she's already done on this problem. Uh, and I've been critical of her in print. I remind her today I will be again, but although I like the book. The basic premise of Stump's book is that there's something misguided about seeking a theoretical answer to the problem of evil. So again, she and Burrell are on the same page there. An end to the traditional sense of theodicy. And what she wants to argue is that it's not argument, well, I guess she is arguing, uh, that it, it's not argument that we want or need about suffering. It's narrative that provides the meaning to suffering. And it's one of the weaknesses, she says, of analytical philosophy is it's so argument driven that it has completely ignored the importance of telling a story to making sense of the meaning of evil. And so her, the heart of her book is a, is a very interesting and detailed exegesis of four stories of suffering in the Bible, and I'll briefly outline them. Now, first part of the book, like a good philosopher, is, is methodological. What am I doing? And she says, I'm concentrating on suffering. I'm not going to explain every evil because the real problem is human suffering. And she says, I want to understand suffering in two ways. She says, one form of suffering is when we are afflicted in such a way that we cannot come to our fulfillment. Something wrecks our life and our ability to flourish as human beings. And she says, a second kind of suffering is what we feel when we lose something that really is important to us, basically someone we love. So it's evil, the evil that we suffer when we, we can't flourish, or the evil that we suffer when what she calls the object of our heart's desire is taken away from us. And that's what she wants to try to explain. She's very, uh, multiple times in this book, she says, I am not purporting to explain the suffering of anybody in particular. This is a argument in the abstract. And she says, um, interestingly enough, that, that I'm not doing theodicy. And the reason I'm not doing theodicy, not only is I don't think traditional ways of doing it really work, but she says, I'm instead doing what's called a defense. And what a defense is, if, if somebody purports, purports to give an argument against the existence of God based on evil, all I'm obliged to do as, as a, a respondent, if you will, as a believer, is give a plausible story that might be true about why there is suffering. Theodicies, according to her, purport to explain to you exactly why the world is the way that it is. A defense says it might be, it might be possible for us, and in her case, to tell a story that would make sense of suffering that might be true. And I'm entitled to hold on to my beliefs because I'm not being illogical, because I've, I've told some story where it all hangs together. So she says, I'm only going to tell, I'm going to describe a possible world where suffering might have this meaning. And again, she says, the key is on stories that are about personal relationships. And she's going to treat the Bible, she says, you may not believe the Bible is the word of God, but it's a good story. And all I need is a story. And if you think it's the word of God, it might be a true story. And it might reflect the way the world really is. Now, she then goes on to make a very interesting uh, contrast and, and distinction. Again, analytic philosophy is way too focused on propositions and arguments. And she says, people that think like that are Dominicans. So that's the Dominican way of thought. It's in the book. So Dominicans tend to be kind of from the head up, arguments, propositions, boom, 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 sort of like Thomas Aquinas. And 
what propositional knowledge gets you is knowledge that. That's the philosopher's term for it. I know that Tim Wakefield is pitching for the Red Sox tonight, and I'm very scared about that prospect. That's knowledge that. Now, but, but he, and she says, analytic philosophy, particularly when it does, deals with this problem, ignores a different kind of knowing. And she describes this as Franciscan knowing, which is knowledge of persons. And that there's something that comes from an interpersonal relationship that you can't really express in a proposition. And that to know another person is a completely different kind of knowing than knowing that a proposition is true. And that it's very important in the dealing with the problem of evil to understand what the nature of personal knowledge is like. Because as, as we get farther down, what you're going to see is that she's going to claim that all suffering can have meaning in the context of a personal relationship with God. And so she's going to say, again, you're not going to get a theoretical resolution, but it might be possible to come to understand something about the meaning of suffering based on personal relationships. And she says that personal knowledge is kind of like perception. It's generally reliable. And that it, it is what is communicated in narrative. If I tell a story about my relationship with God, I invite you into my personal relationship with God. And that stories are the way that people tell other people about their personal relationship with God. And again, you can only do that by telling a story, not by writing a metaphysical treatise. Here, let me tell you what God is like. It's all uh, in the relationship. So that narrative about a personal relationship with someone else is the way in which you invite other people to enter into your interaction um, with that person, obviously God. So that's what she's going to do. Second part of the book is like, OK, what are we talking about here? I need to define some terms. And uh, the first thing she has to define is love. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're going to tell any kind of a story about the meaning of suffering, it has to end in deeper love. That's what Dante understood in the Divine Comedy. Somehow the answer for the whole thing in the end has to be love. And if, at, if what is at stake is, does God still love me when I'm suffering? What does love mean? What would it mean for God to love you? She goes into long discussions of contemporary theories of love. And she comes back to Aquinas and she says, I'm going to go with Aquinas' definition of love. And Aquinas' definition of love involves two volitions, two willings. If I love someone, I wish them well. If I love you, I want you to flourish. And if I love you, I want to be united with you. So we could say well-wishing and uniting are the two impulses that love has. Love can be responsive to the good of the other. Uh, love can. Uh, he, she goes into different kinds of love, depending upon the persons that you love. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to skip all that. Let's just, just remember the love piece. OK. Then she says, um, union. Let's talk about what union is. She said, union, a personal union, requires presence and closeness and shared activity. If I'm in a personal union with you, we have to be able to talk to each other. We have to be able to share our thoughts and our feelings with each other. And we both have to be active in the relationship. It's like what Aristotle says, you can't be friends with somebody who's not a friend with you. It has to be mutual. And the same thing is true with God. So this involves self-disclosure, shared attention. And the, one of the interesting points she makes about personal relationships is to the degree to which one of the parties in the relationship is morally disintegrated, that is, not truly unified, that person will be hindered in their relationship with the other person. So that the capacity for friendship with anyone, including God, is going to be affected by the state of your soul and the moral integrity of your soul. And so it may be the case that you have to be, your soul has to get reordered in order for you to truly love and be in the presence of another person, and in this case, i.e. God. And she said that the, it, she assumes in her possible world that we do live in a world marked by original sin. 
And the way that that original sin, the old statement, used to be concupiscence and uh, ignorance. We don't know what we should. And our, our desires are disordered. And she says, that's what I'm taking to be uh, the, the condition after the fall, is human beings typically have disordered desires. And that we're not wholehearted in our, in our moral attention, if you will. And to that degree, we're not as free as we could be. And that the only way to be truly free and to love truly is to be totally integrated and focused on the good, i.e. God. She's very interested in shame. And shame is, a, is the mark of a certain kind of moral disintegration where we fear abandonment by someone that we desire because of something that we've done. And shame makes us afraid to encounter somebody. She also spends a lot of time talking about guilt and how guilt, likewise, is a barrier to a personal relationship. And she describes our condition as, uh, if you will, willed loneliness. That's what it means to be disordered, it is that we don't know how to get out of the loneliness of our disordered souls and really enter into a relationship with God. Now, this, if you will, barrier to our relationship with God, and if you can probably see where I'm going, she's going to say suffering is what, in some cases, you need to go through to have that ability to truly open yourself up to God. She says it's a premise of, of her um, theat, well, not her project, Anne Aquinas, is that we are in a state of original sin. And that we, the only way out of that state is for God to do something to us. And she goes into a long discussion uh, about grace and the will, and I'm not going to go into it, and I'm not convinced she's completely right. Uh, but the real thorny piece is, if you believe that fallen human beings live in this willed loneliness of psychic disintegration, the only way to begin the restoration and the healing is for God's grace to do something on you. And the big argument has always been, what's the relationship between that act of grace and the human will? Um, she kind of, I think she's a little semi-Pelagian, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, so she starts to talk about justification. You need to be justified. That is, turn away from sin, turn towards God. And then you need ongoing sanctification in your life, where you cooperate with the grace of God. And God works in both of those. Okay. That's the backdrop. Now the stories. Story of Job. Uh, we've already gone through the story of Job. Here's what's salient about her treatment of Job. She's a, an equal opportunity offender. She likes to tweak everybody. So she goes through the Anchor Bible commentary on Job and basically says they don't know what they're talking about in the Anchor Bible. She, biblical theolo anybody who's a biblical theologian, she will offend you in this book. Um, but she says, I, I can do that because I'm not telling you it's the Bible. I'm just telling you it's a story, and this is how I'm going to read it. He, she, he, she says about Job, he does get a kind of answer. And that the creation speech by God at the end is not a showcase of power. But that really what God is saying to Job in the whirlwind is, I created everything. I take care of everything. For the fishes in the sea and everything else, I'm their father. I'm their creator. And a fortiori, I'm going to take care of you. And I am taking care of you. And her claim is, and this is the, the claim of the book, it's really an, an audacious claim, is that the creator God would only allow suffering if some greater good could defeat it for the person who suffers it. So the task of this book and the rest of the book is to show how it's possible, again, possible, that there is some good that comes for the person who is suffering out of affliction and even terrible affliction. Because most people would say, it, it's, there's no answer that involves, well, it's for the moral betterment of others or the world or the word order or anything else. The, she puts God in the dock and is demanding of God in this possible world that, we be, that in theory it's possible that every single instance of suffering can lead to the benefit of the person who suffers, possibly. And what the stories, I'm trying to get to the chase fast, what the stories all show is how that can work. 
So Job suffers terrible affliction. And at the end of the story, Job gets a personal answer. He doesn't get knowledge that, like, hey, here's the explanation. But he gets a knowledge of God that he did not have before. He is face to face with his creator. He becomes a better person as a result of his suffering. His greatness is magnified. We still read the book of Job. He's one of the most important figures in all of world literature. God works for the good of Job in a way that Job did not understand and never will understand. We don't need understanding in the theoretical sense to go on. We need the Franciscan knowledge of God that Job had at the end of the story. There's a third person explanation in the story, the whole Satan thing, that, God, that Job never gets. Job gets a singular gift of intimacy, honor, and glory. Now, you might be saying to yourself, as I was as I'm reading this, okay, what about his family that got slaughtered? Okay, so Job is a better person at the end of the book of Job. And by the way, Stump's going to argue that the goods that are available to the sufferers are goods that could only be had through suffering. Because if there was another way to do it, God should have done it the other way. So there's, there's a unique benefit for each individual through the suffering that that individual undergoes in terms of it furthering the person's relationship with God. And as we'll see in a moment, that's the ultimate good. That's the only thing that matters. It's the good. So if you can say that every instance of suffering is potentially beneficial to the sufferer in going closer to God, or, I'll say this in a little while, staying away from hell, because that's the ultimate evil, then that's the benefit of that suffering. Okay, second story, Samson. She has a really interesting uh, account of Samson, and she does it in dialogue uh, with Milton, which makes it really, really interesting. She draws on literature, uh, and her take on Samson is that he's, he's an instance of somebody who brought evil on himself. So Job didn't do anything. Samson did. And uh, there's a lot of debate about what, why was Samson afflicted. And I think Milton says something about his garrulity. He talked too much. Um, she doesn't think that's the case. You know, the, the, the moment where um, Samson finally discloses to Delilah the reason for his strength, and there's a lot of debate about is he telling the truth? Does he really believe that? Why would he say that? All that other stuff. The way she tells the story is a one of gradual moral degradation for Samson. Samson starts off as the hero, and I'm making this way too simple, but eventually is too full of himself and loses touch with God and doesn't appreciate that the real source of his strength is not his hair. It's his relationship with God. And when his relationship with God goes south, and, and by the way, if you, if you know the story, he, he's not a paragon of virtue. He's you know, kind of sleeping around, sleeping around with Delilah. Uh, he's not doing the things he's supposed to do. He's not being faithful to his people. Samson degrades in the midst of all this. And his downfall affects himself internally and everything else. And he doesn't value his gift from God. So it's not the haircut. It's his relationship with God that's the problem. And as you know, Samson is in, uh, he's imprisoned, and uh, the, the um, what do you call them? The enemies. The Philistines are throwing a party uh, to their God with him there. He's on display. And at that moment, Samson turns, and he prays to God. And he realizes, I've made a mess of everything. I'm all alone. I'm blind, I've been unfaithful, hear my prayer. And God answers Samson's prayer. Presumably he dies in a kind of glory, not the way he expected, but closer to God than he ever has been in his whole life. Another example of how a perpetrator of evil can through suffering find a, a redemption and a completion of his vocation in a way that he never would have expected. Abraham, one of the toughest stories uh, in the Bible. And if you had to read Kierkegaard and Siv, you know 
Kierkegaard's got this big thing about the teleological suspension of the ethical. Do I do the right thing or I do what God tells me to do? Stump says Kierkegaard's got it all wrong. So again, she's an she, equal opportunity offender. Now, I'm not, I can't get into the details of the story, but here's her take on Abraham. Uh, Abraham is given a promise by God. He's going to have the thing he wants more than anything else in life. This is the desire of the heart. This is not his own good. I want a child of my own. I want progeny. And the angel comes and says, you know, next year you're going to have a child. Now, in the meantime, Abraham has slept around a little bit. Uh, and he has some kids. I'm really simplifying the story. And there, there's these repeated encounters with Abraham and God saying, hey, remember that promise? And they, they kind of reconnect on the promise often enough. Her take is Abraham is double-minded about God. Yeah, yeah, I'm trusting the promise, but just in case, I've got Ishmael. Uh, so that he trusts God, but not completely. He's hedging his bets with God. And God is gradually leading Abraham to a point where the test is Isaac. Now you must sacrifice Isaac. And everybody psychologized what's going through Abraham's head from the fathers of the church to, uh, to Eleanor Stump himself, herself. What she thinks this whole series of trials has led Abraham to is to an absolute trust that God would fulfill the promise, though he knew not how. Her take is, he says, I don't know how God is going to do this, but God promised me Isaac, and somehow I'm going to get Isaac, and God's going to be faithful to the promise, though I have no idea how that will work. And it's in that moment where he's tested to this absolute, complete trust in the goodness of God, that Abraham realizes his high moment, if you will, this is why he's our father in faith, and he gets Isaac. He's the father of a great nation. Last story, and then I'll conclude. Uh, Mary of Bethany. She conflates Mary of Bethany, uh, and, and, and it's in the Gospel of John, where Lazarus, Mary, and... Um, Martha, that story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. There's a following story of an anointing um, that comes afterwards. This is a story of, she chooses this story. Now, one of the things you, you ask about yourself, or I do, is why did she choose the stories that she chose? And why did she leave out some other stories? Clearly, she thinks these make a point. But what she likes about the Mary of Bethany story, she says, well, let's tell a story of an ordinary person uh, who loses her heart's deepest desire. I just dealt with Abraham. Uh, but in this case, it's the story of a woman whose deepest desires, it turns out, really, are her brother, whom she loves, and her relationship with Jesus. And as you remember in the story in John, uh, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, hey, Lazarus is really sick, expecting Jesus to come. They've seen him heal lots of people. And he, Jesus says to his disciples, we're going to wait a couple of days. This, and he says, this will end for the glory of God. And by the time Jesus and his disciples get to Bethany, according to the way Stump reads the story, Mary is heartbroken. She won't even, in the story, she is not there when Jesus comes. And she reads the story as like, she's devastated that she lost her brother, and she's devastated that Jesus didn't come. There's all sorts of exegesis about, you know, Martha then goes back and says to Mary, hey, come on, the Lord calls for you, and there's nothing in the scripture about that. So she, um, she thinks Martha just tells a little, little fib. Mary, and the way Stump tells the story is Mary has withdrawn into willed loneliness. She's pushed Jesus away. She doesn't want to be with Martha. She just thinks her whole world has crumbled. And when she comes to meet Jesus, she says Jesus wasn't ready for this, but that's a whole other thing. She says Jesus wasn't ready for her being as heartbroken as he was, which is why he weeps. It's like, oh, jeez. And he weeps because she doesn't trust that he can still fulfill the promise that Lazarus isn't really dead and that he really does love her and cares for her as a friend cares for a friend. So Jesus is shaken by the fact that they don't trust him enough that he's there and this somehow is going to come out all right. And so she, in the end of the story, is better than she was at the beginning of the story precisely because of the loss of Lazarus 
and the renewed sense of the power of Jesus and also of Jesus' care and concern for her. Uh, there's other stuff in there too, but she thinks she's now told you four stories that show how God can work through suffering to bring about the good for the sufferer. So the concluding part of the book is, all right, let me lay it all out. I'm going to do that in five minutes, the whole big picture. Here's a quote from her. Her thesis is, God is justified in allowing human beings to endure suffering such as that experienced by Job, Samson, Abraham, and Mary in the stories because, and this is very carefully crafted, through their suffering and only by its means, God gives to each of the protagonists something that these sufferers are willing to trade their suffering to receive once they understand the nature of what they are given. Part of her thesis is that it's, it's integral to the benefit of the sufferer that the sufferer not understand what's going on. Because it, it, be it would be a whole different thing if Jesus had sent a note to Mary before and said, hey, don't worry, I'm going to get there in a couple of days and you're going to be all right. And Lazarus is going to be all right. So she says that it's integral to the benefit that the sufferer not understand it and maybe never will in this life. Because again, there's another worldly perspective. Now she says, look, um, in order for me to make that case, there's a couple of assumptions that, you, that she has to make, and, and if you don't make them, this thing does not work. Uh, the first is that the good of human life is union with God. That's the good for the sake of which all the suffering is designed. And that the ultimate evil is hell. She says, I, you know, she says, you can throw hell out if you don't like it, but you gotta have heaven to make this possibly work as a theodicy. Because it, it and she says, too many theodicies get bogged down in trying to explain how in this world there's some benefit. She says, if you believe in another world, you don't have to be able to point to the benefit right now. So she accepts, and she thinks this is Aquinas' position, that God allows suffering only because he can bring from it a greater good for the person. So that all suffering can be turned by God to some good for the sufferer. Now, if the greatest state is in union with God, that begins now in sanctification and deification, when it comes to suffering, if suffering brings the, the sufferer closer to God in this life, that, uh, she doesn't put it this way, that has an eternal payoff. Because the closer you are to God in this life, the deeper your life in heaven is going to be. So it's worth anything in this life to get closer to God because God is going to be an internal, e eternal good. She likewise says you have to assume any suffering that wards off hell is worth it because hell is the worst possible state that you could be in. So heaven is such a great benefit that it can justify any kind of suffering, and hell is such a great harm that it can justify any kind of suffering that might ward that off as well. Suffering is, she claims, medicinal, to heal the wounded psyche. It's how we get rearranged inside. And we never know, in a particular situation, what the overriding benefit might be, or might have been, should the sufferer have chosen uh, to avail him or herself of that. Now, how could, she, go, she says, one of the things that Aquinas doesn't talk about is what she talks about with respect to the desires of the heart. Aquinas is more worried about the good of flourishing. She says, we have to also be able to tell a story about how is it that losing somebody that I loved could be for my benefit, and then we should ask the other question, how could it be for the benefit of that person who is lost, who dies? So she says, uh, and this is the problem of Job's children. You could say, hey, it was good for Job that he lost his kids, what about his kids? And she, her simple answer is, if you believe in heaven, they got in heaven faster. So they've got an eternal good. And again, eternal good always trumps temporal suffering. I'm putting this a little bit simply, but you can, you can make something of an argument like that. So she says, the more, she said, I'm not worried about the sufferees who suffer because they have the possibility of an eternal benefit. What she wants to argue is that for somebody who loses what they cared about the most, 
there is a benefit to that. And that what these stories show collectively is that we can lose something that we think is of a certain value to us and get it back on the other side of suffering revalued in the light of what we learned when we went through the suffering. This is, again, this idea of we need our wants and desires maybe flipped around a little bit. And she says, in the sufferings that we've talked about, Abraham gets his heart's desire in a different way. So too does Mary. And they get it in a different way than they expected, and that was only attainable through the suffering. So that the heartbreak of loss is offset by unexpected gift on the other side of the loss. And that since God is the best and deepest desire of our heart, when we see everything in the light of God, we realize that it's all a gift, and we don't take it for granted the way that we did before. Okay, finally, the toughest question. Oh, maybe the toughest question. How can we show that God's allowance of evil is the best means to enable the sufferer to get the desire of her heart? That's a, a question that you can, I think we would all concede, and she does a little bit here, that there are cases where the sufferer gets a benefit as a result of the suffering. The question is, can you show that there was no other way to learn what you needed to learn, to come to desire in a different way, to be a different person, couldn't you have done this in a different way, we want to say? And again, she's not saying I can explain every case, but she's saying it is possible that suffering can lead to psychic integration and deeper union with God all the time. And remember, death is not the ultimate evil. And she talks about Milton and how uh, Milton's blindness made him an even better writer than he would have been. And she tells, uh, I'm going to almost conclude with um, a, a very moving passage that she cites. Um, she goes into science. She tells lots of stories. There's a woman named Claiborne Park uh, who had a daughter with autism. And she wrote a memoir of what it was like to deal with her daughter with autism. And that's when this is a desire of the heart pain, to see the daughter that you love not able to function at a very high level. And she says, I do not forget the pain. It aches in a particular way when I look at Jessie's friends, some of them just her age, and allow myself for a moment to think of all she cannot be. But we cannot sift experience and take only the part that does not hurt us. Let me say simply and straight out that simple knowledge the whole world knows. I breathe like everyone else my century's thin, faithless air and I do not want to be sentimental. But the blackest sentimentality of all is that trahison des clairs, which will not recognize the good it has been given to understand because it is too simple. That's my place there. So then, this experience we did not choose, which we would have given everything to avoid, has made us different, has made us better. Through it, we have learned the lesson that no one studies willingly, the hard, slow lesson of Sophocles and Shakespeare, that one grows by suffering. And that, too, is Jesse's gift. I write now what 15 years past I would still not have thought possible to write, that if today I were given the choice to accept the experience with everything that it entails, or to refuse the bitter largesse, I would have to stretch out my hands. Because out of it has come, for all of us, an unimagined life. And I will not change the last word of the story. It is still love. Now, that's a very powerful story. And I read it very moved by it. The, the counter argument here is for every good story like that, somebody else gets defeated or apparently gets defeated by evil and gets done in by it. I just read over the summer, and I've been talking about it ad nauseum, uh, Unbroken, uh, which is an incredible story of human suffering and that, that looks like it's ruining this guy's life that this is an indefeasible evil, as the philosophers would say. 
And at the low point of this, he has a revelation about God and a conversion about God. And he comes to see his entire past in a completely different fashion in the light of this experience of God. It's a, I cannot help but think about reading that book and hearing these stories. That you would think, what possible good could come out of the horrible evil that this guy suffered? And he finds it. And Stump's contention is we only need for that to be possibly true to defend God. That it is possible that even for the sufferer, some good that could, could not come any other way might come out of that suffering. It's an audacious claim. Uh, it's an interesting claim. And it only works if you believe everything is relativized over to the love of God forever and that anything that gets us there and that gets us more deeply is worth it. And she says, uh, just to, and I'll stop here and take some questions if you want, you can expect it the closer you get to God. And that it is precisely in that closeness to God. I just happened to be reading uh, a book about Mother Teresa recently too and her horrible suffering at the end of her life in the darkness of her own soul. So, I haven't answered the question of suffering. Uh, maybe I've given you something to think about. Maybe you want to read this 480-page book. Uh, maybe you want to read my book review of it and save you the trouble uh, of the entire book. Uh, I'll stop, and uh, we